ask for this for me, my family, in this house, in this church, we're going to stand for the Lord and liberty in the Holy Ghost. There's no independence like what happened at our moment of salvation. Amen? All right, I, I'm going to, I, I wrote something, and then, so this is not so much like a preaching and a teaching. It's going to be a little bit difficult. I'm just going to ask you to just sit through it. But uh, right now we're in a situation where we're in a world that we don't recognize and things are changing and no one knows how it's going. And so I, I, I wrote something, and again, I'm going to primarily read a lot of it, so you'll be looking at the screen, and I'll, I might fill in the blanks a little bit. But I want to talk about the positive side of drastic change. Nobody likes change because we are traditionalists, we are habitual, we avoid a lot of things because we want to be as secure as we possibly can. And, but I want to, you know, you hear people say, I read the Bible and I went all the way to the end and I read the end and I realized in the end we win. Okay, well, that, that's cute and it's funny, but it also is soberly true. So we want to go to Revelation. They got one verse. And in Proverbs eleven fifteen, it says, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. In other words, all 66 books of the Bible are moving about the redemption of man on the earth. And we're moving all the way to the fact that there will be a time where the earth is under the pure domination of King Jesus. There is no, we have no king but Jesus. Say it with I have no king but Jesus. All right. So, so I like to say that when Elaine and I were dating, when I first met her, she lived way out in the country. And to go see her was like an epic journey for somebody who was raised on the West Bank in New Orleans and so on. But every step of the way was valuable to me because of where I was going to wind up, okay? So uh, I went to go see her, and I, I, I drove as far as I could on the interstate. And then... I drove off and I got on an asphalt road. And then I drove and I got on a gravel road. And then I rode and rode and rode. And then I got on a, it turned into a, 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 just a dirt road. And then I rode and rode and went through a cattle guard and drove across a pasture. And then I got down to the point where there was a little creek I couldn't drive and there was a, there was a rope hanging. And I, I swung, I swung on the rope and got onto the other side. And there was a little footpath, and I went through that, and I got up, and I got up to the house, and there was a little sign on the door, gone to the country. <laughs> now, back to this. When I go to Siberia, I love our church people in Siberia. It's just wonderful. Wayne, Wayne and I went with Anthony and so on, and it's a tremendously long flight just to get to Moscow. And then you have to sit there, run. They, 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 it was frantic to get us to the next plane that was going to Siberia, and then you fly and fly and fly for six and a half hours uh, across icebergs and everything and so on to get to Siberia. Okay. Then after being there and preaching, we're going to come back. And again, the whole time, squeezed in a seat between these big men and, and just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there and going through all that the whole time. Everything about that trip was wonderful because I knew that night I was going to be home in my bed with Elaine. You understand that? So when you have a vision then everything along the way that might be torturous to other people becomes beautiful. I want to tell you there is a positive side of drastic change that we see in this world. Because if you don't look out, the God of this world through CNN and all of this devil vision 
the report of all of the people who have no hope in Christ, you're going to find yourself murmuring and complaining about divine intervention for God to make this kingdom of the world pass away and present it to his dear son. Give him a shout for what he's doing in here. So we want to talk about the positive side of drastic change. Now, I'm going to be reading a lot of this. You can follow along with me. Spiritually, we really must seek God by meditating in his word to be able to prepare our hearts in this inexplicable seasons of change because nobody can really understand this and everybody in the whole world is sharing in this thing where you can't understand this. So only when we comprehend how intimidating human spirits experience is in reaction to drastic change do we understand the necessary to leave the world and find ourselves in the kingdom of God in the purpose of Jesus who is the same yesterday today and forever as the world rock and rolls the kingdom of God does not shake give him another shout so in his presence not out there in never never chaotic land where even the doctors, the politicians, everybody has different explanations. Wear a mask so you won't get sick. Wear a mask and you'll get sick because you breathe in your carbon dioxide. It's a breathe. You know, you, you have all of these chaotic, crazy things. Take this pill and a, and a zinc and, and, and it'll kill the virus. The other one, you take that and it's going to kill you without the virus. Does anybody know what I'm talking about out there? So it is reassuring to know that although we are required to live in time and changing seasons, our God doesn't live in time and change. He lives in eternity. He's the same yesterday, today, forever, and he is not surprised at anything. Matter of fact, he is allowing divine intervention to make this kingdom of the world bow the knee to the kingdom of his dear son. Give him a shout that he's moving on there. Instead of reacting to that, 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 this is hard on me, you know, I don't know. Instead of, instead of murmuring, you need to shout that the king is coming and he's coming soon. Maranatha, the Lord comes soon. I hear from pastors all the time, and they all, I don't know what we're going to do. We might lose the ministry and say, hey, Jack, have you ever preached that it's going to get worse and worse, and now it gets worse and worse, and you want to pray that it doesn't? We need to exchange the worldview and find out that this is not a surprise to God. If you see the world in chaos, understand, wait a minute, God's not impotent. God's not ignorant. God's not blind. God didn't die. The devil is not in control. Don't give power to the devil. He's a defeated foe. God said the whole earth groans and shakes and belches and whines. It goes into convulsive labor pains trying to birth the new kingdom in here. Come on, give him a shout. Don't look at me like a cow. You cannot believe the report of the world. You can't come in and murmur against the fact that God is in control. We all enjoy the verse when we're feeling good that the kingdom of this world has been stepped on like a cockroach on a colonolium fork. And God now exalts himself in the person of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and peace. But why don't we understand that in order for God to take us from where we are to where this can happen, why are we surprised that the whole world is rocking and rolling? I'll tell you why, because it disturbs your little world. It upsets your paycheck. You can't do what you want. You, you, you know, you, 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 say, 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 I don't mind God doing this thing, but he doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to rock my boat. And when the powerless realize they, 
Their powerlessness made them a victim. Their reaction is to complain and whine and question God. Murmuring is the dying gasp of the powerless. You're not a victim. You're a victor. You're more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer in this life. Agreeing with and saying yes to God in his ultimate wisdom of change is a function of our, only if your will has been motivated by revelation of the Holy Ghost. I've been persuaded by God that he's in control and the devil's not. The liberals are not in control. They're but pawns to affect a change. And if God didn't want them to him, he'd kill him in a minute. God didn't you see a kitchen got on the blind side. God sits on his throne and he, he ponders the heart of his own people that they can't understand. He's still in control. Rather than joining in with the dying world's woes and, and their complaints and their fears, we should be filled with hope. Look at somebody say, Maranatha, he comes soon. My God is still on the throne. I persuaded to believe that he knows what he's doing. And I thank God that I'm on the boat with him. I'm on the ark. I'm not lost. I'm not confused because I know who has control of the future. I know the future, the Lord said. It's a good one. You hear people say, oh, you know, you know, I'm going to go to heaven and all, but you know, I see how it is now. I'm worried about my grandchildren. Let me ask you something. Do you think the God of love figured in your grandchildren? You think he loves them less? You think he's going to leave them? At, he's, he's just going to forget about them to affect his change? Our great God knows when a hair falls off a bald head. He knows when a sparrow falls off. My God knows everything, the past, present. And do you think that he's going to affect change to set up Jesus on the throne and he didn't think about your granddaughter? And I bless your children and your children's children and your children's children that they'll be mighty in the kingdom, overcomers, blessed and favored of God. In this unprecedented shakeup of world economics, you know, look, I think it says in Ezekiel, misery loves company, okay, somewhere in the Bible. I'm going to tell you what, in Cuba, in Africa, the indigenous people in the Amazon, everybody's in this. Nobody has escaped this. We're not in this alone. This is not just the church. God wants to let, renew us that Jesus is really coming back. It's just not a thought. It's a fact, sweetheart. There have been generations. Oh, there was an earthquake. Oh, there was a tornado. Oh, there was this. Uh, Jesus is coming back. Jack, even stupid people can see he's coming back. You cannot leave God out of your, 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 your information. The, mech, the moment you leave God out of the equation, you're always going to come up with the wrong answer. Say with me, I know in whom I have believed, and I know he's able to deliver me and all of mine. To God be the glory, the devil is a liar. We very easily see the reactions of society by looking at the devil vision, that this sudden drastic change has produced very negative effects of fear, rage, anger, despair, as you've seen people going crazy, doing ridiculous things. We are warned to avoid any association with rebellious people, okay? So if you don't respect this fag, I'm sure there's some weird church you can, you'll feel comfortable in out there. As for here, 
was submitted to authority. Proverbs 24 says you submit yourself to God by submitting to the king. You understand that? And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to prophesy to you. If you don't like the president we have right now, God will biblically raise up another Jehu, whacked out, last choice, God's choice, to be able to feed Jezebel to the dogs. I'm going to tell you that's going to happen. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Because he is in the process of restoring his kingdom on the earth. And he's letting it all play out. And people make a choice. And by giving them time, they damn themselves because the grace was here all along. But men love darkness and they rejected light. And therefore, there'll be condemnation to them. And there'll be sheep on one side and goats on the other. It's going to happen. There's going to be President Jehu from now on. And it won't be your choice. It won't be this choice. It won't be that. It's going to be God's choice. And I'm going to tell you, the devil will not be exalted. He's clearing the way. When I make a road in my place on a bulldozer and a bobcat, it's terrible destruction. It upsets the squirrels, the chipmunks, the neighbors. I don't care. It just looks like it looks chaotic. But it paves the way. And everything that's in the way got to go. So that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I have no king but Jesus. Shabbatata. The devil is a liar. Change as designed by God's wisdom, not the scientists, not the doctors, not the politicians. Change is the thing I got. It's an unavoidable process of life. God moves naturally and spiritually to move us where he wills us to be. You ever seen a mama, one of these young mamas, got a toddler or two, and they're on a, the sliding board and everything else. She says, time to go. And she takes them by the hand, and, just, and then she just drags their little butt to the car. And she sticks them in the car seat. And then they're gone. And you're going home get a nap. I'm telling you, we're at the point whether you want to move or not, God's going to move your rear section. You're going to go screaming and hollering. God's going to move you. Because we're children of God. I don't want to go. I don't want you to do this. I don't want to let loose of that. I want this. I don't like this. Psalm 32, 9, do not be as the horse and mule that I don't want to put a bit and bridle on them. But if I don't put a bit and bridle on them, they go each their own way and they won't come to me. I've had people call me up. I'm so deep in debt and I, no matter what I do and I tithe and offering, it's because you don't listen. So he's got to keep you in a small, narrow squeeze because you don't, he can't let you loose. I don't want my marriage. Yeah, because you don't listen. I can't get in bed. No, no, you, you got to be in a tight place because if you're in a tight place, you just run like hell anywhere you want to go. I'm going to keep you in the valley of tight and lack because you'd run away from me on the mountain of liberty. So don't be like the horse and the mule. Seek first the kingdom of God. Learn how to obey whether you like it or not so he can give you a little bit more room to run around. Change 
changes God's dynamic of growing up. He births us as a babe that can't even have the whole word. It's got to eat a little bit of milk, a little noonie bottle. It's a reckoning, reckoning that God is moving us to a point that he chose, not what's on your prayer list. Acceptance of God's will is not the necessity of recognizing that change is inevitable, as it is. It's knowing when change comes, whatever, whatever the king says, I'm, I'm going to be part of it. I'm going to join with it. Because it's not me telling him my will. It's him telling me in this earth, on this earth, the kingdom of God says it's this. You know, you go from somebody else changing your diaper to you move up to having accidents to finally enjoying your pull-up, <laughs> to finally going, I got to go. I got to go. Mommy, I got to go. And little by little, you move from here to there. And what happens? The more you have inner control, the more he can take the diaper off, which is external control. But until you can't control yourself from the inside, somebody can control you from the outside. You got to be fenced in until you understand it ain't smart to run into traffic. Hee haw, hee haw. Be not like the horse and the mule that's got to have external control because he got no internal control, which there's no spirit obedience. Now, how come, uh, why is it that when they're like 911, Everybody went to church after 911. Why? Wow, that was a wake up call. You need God. But, but after nobody else got blown up, they went back, they left the promised land, went backwards over Jordan, back to where they had that nice little life. So God is always trying to give them an opportunity to seek God and His kingdom. But most people want to go back to habit and tradition and familiar. And so he just gets rid of your familiar. See, change is inherent to the very nature of God's kingdom. We know he says, and I set a king up and I knock him down. I've, I, many worlds have I created and many worlds have I destroyed. God is always intervening in man. And when you really start the scripture from all 66 books and really see it in revelation of how God moves, God's not given to instant anything. In other words, nobody ever gave birth to a baby with a doctrine in law. Nobody ever, a baby came out, hey, mom, man, I'm so glad to, you know, I'm so glad to be out of here. I mean, I mean, that's water in my nose and you know, that hole stuck up in me. I tell you what, and, and he and you, daddy, man, that's driving me crazy, okay? I mean, nobody comes out speaking the language or knowing how to eat food, knowing how to do that. You have to understand, God has this prolonged, moment to moment process over time. And then he tells us we were born. He tells us we're his children. He tells us we're going to mature. God gives us a physical so that we can understand the spiritual. The problem is, is when somebody gets born and they never, ever want to come out their mama. Well, what happens is, we get born again in salvation and we never move. 
the kingdom is just too far away. The kingdom is too unfamiliar of what I left yesterday. So I'd rather have salvation up against my normal rather than have to give up everything that was normal for me to move further. My little granddaughter, my great-granddaughter Katie, yesterday we were, we were together for the fourth and all that, and I was, she was doing so many cute things, and I'd go, she'd look at me, and I'd go to reach for her, but she'd grab her mama. I'm, I'm her, I'm her great-grandfather, but she'd rather keep the familiar. God tries to move us, and we grab everything, even what's not good for us. Funky friends, bad relationships, bad habits. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, yeah. She even learned, she takes her little arm, and she hooks it around Morgan, so you can't even, you can't, rather, she, she can be a sumo wrestler. She ain't let you, she's, she's stuck. Now, would you say he is processing me a little at a time, over time? Even in the scripture, it says you will take the land little by little. Despise not small, little steps. Now, again, don't write me, don't text me, please don't. I'm irritable, don't do it. I love to respond to you. But my personal, this is personal. I'm not telling you that you own my beliefs. I'm telling you, I, I still have the Supreme Court. Well, I used to have the right to free speech. We don't have that no more. But anyway, my personal understanding is God using two forms of maturing growth. One of them is gradualism. Little by little, God processes us, even to the point of seven times if you fall down the same day. He doesn't slap you. He just picks you up and do it again. Let's try it again, okay? Then iterative. Iterative is, I call it, inculcation, repetition, the same thing over and over again. But it's a different, man, I told you three times, you deaf. No, God says to you and says it to you and says it to you, and there's no anger and frustration when you still didn't get it. Because he, not like us, is patient, merciful, and long-suffering. And we don't realize that day after day since your salvation... He is consistently irritative without being irritable. He has forgiven your thought life, your bad emotions, your vain imaginations, the negative words out your mouth without you being convicted and confessing and repenting. His mercy just keeps bathing you day after day with no reproach, no rebuke, no condemnation, no frustration. Give him a shout for his love and mercy. Jesus! And we're blind to it and we take it for granted. I thought life alone that we would never religiously let another person know what we're thinking and imagining. It's constantly being washed by the blood. And he doesn't even make us feel bad about it. Now, as we live in time moving on, does anyone understand? Look, I told you late last night, we were talking, we got home uh, late last night, and all of a sudden, I mean, it really came on me. Hey, I got to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I got to get over there. I got to preach two, two times tomorrow. But I felt last night when we got home that I had just come from the believers meeting last Sunday night. It's like, when the helicopter did the week go? And during that week, we had everything in the world go on. Plus, Libby had a birthday. And three days later, Nathan had a, his birthday. And, and, and then, you know, we had the 4th of July. Just going to, 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 to. I did a funeral. I, I, I'm dealing with a man in, uh, in uh, hospice. All that going on, everything going on. It's just, 
And I'm going to tell you, I'm older than I was this morning. Hey. So God is moving us in time, progressing towards eternal purposes that have nothing to do with temporal time. Now, what you say, God moves people. Say, God moves every person and every nation. And I wrote here, whether they want to or not. There are people being moved in every place in the world right now, whether they want to or not. He's not asking you. You ever see people, they, everybody makes a mistake. You got little, little bitty children. You take them to the restaurant. What would you like? What do you want? Do you want chicken or fish sticks? What do you want? Now, this thing is still about the wet its pants, and you giving it the freedom to t tell you what, they, what it wants to order off the menu. Can't read, but you know, you understand that? Well, God doesn't go, what would you want? Mark, what would you like me to do for you today? I love you so much, I put, I put everything on hold. What would you like me to do? <laughs> God is moving in eternity and processing everything to there's going to be a point in your history when the kingdom of this world is under the feet of the kingdom of my dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ, where every knee will bow and everything will, everyone will confess from the high to the low. And there'll be no mistake about it. There'll be a, 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 are you okay with this? He has prophetic promises, and he's moving towards it. I like in the book of Mark, Jesus illustrates the progressive nature. Say with me, the progressive nature. Now, again, you can read the Bible as it is and make sense of it the way it is in the natural, that a man was a farmer and he planted seed. Now, Mark 4, 26 through 28, and Jesus was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man, a farmer, who casts seed upon the ground, and then he goes in, and he goes to bed, and he wakes up, and he drinks coffee, goes out, he waters, he shoes the crows away and all that. But like he has no, he, he's lost control and doesn't understand how that seed that he put in the ground is going to come up and bear stalks with many grains on it. So now watch. Truly, truly, we talked about this before when we talked about the virgin birth. When you see the word seed in the Bible, we instantly think of wheat and corn and, and things like that. But that word in the Greek and the Hebrew is sperm. Okay. Now, when, Mary, when, when young Mary was Jesus was concerned it was the the uh, incorruptible sperm of the Holy Spirit that impregnated her that Jesus could be born of incorruptible seed where all of us were born of corruptible seed because our mamas and our daddies were lost causes okay and so that nature that self nature is in us what he wants to do is, when Jesus died, the Lord planted Jesus in the ground. And the supernatural coming up was the believers, the body of Christ, now born of incorruptible sperm. So we have the DNA of the Father right now. But we act like children. You ever notice that children that you birth them, you, you, you do everything for them, and you nurture them. And then when they get up to a certain age, hey, I love you, Dad, but don't tell me what to do. It's my life. Well, who the hell gave you that life, Buster? You know, who fed you to get you to this point? Okay, You understand there's a, something in us that we get to a certain point. We don't care who our daddy is. We want our life, and we want to be the Lord of our life. 
Uh, nobody knows what I'm talking about. It's okay. It's all right. Okay. 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 All right. So understand, God's got the same problem. He sows Jesus into the earth, and Jesus produces children with incorruptible DNA in them to do to the will of the Father, except they don't. Matter of fact, I don't want to cut the grass. I don't want to put the trash out. I, just start, I don't want to brush my teeth. I don't want to take a bath. I don't want to wear that. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to do that. And you say, oh, you're going to do it. You might be wounded doing it, but you're going to do it. Okay. <laughs> so God says, I got these, all these babies with incorruptible seed in them, and they're all going to be in heaven, and they all don't want to live in me, but I can't possibly let them live in me like that. Right. And since I never change, they're going to have to. So I'm going to invent progressive change over a lifetime, and they ain't going to like none of the changes. Now, we obviously see that Father God is not looking for instant maturity because he allows the birth process and then all along growing up as children, adolescents, adults, all the way till we get out here. And as I tried to tell you, most Christians don't understand we spend from time of salvation most of our lives being mentored by the Holy Spirit where we're still not obedient to the kingdom. We still have a lot of control in our own life and, and, and that it takes a long time before we finally get it and then we want to and then we move into learning and so we're ever learning without ever coming to the level of the truth because if we learn, when we finally learn it, we still may not be able to practice it because we got other people in our life. You know, the people are constantly provoking you. How, how can I live in the kingdom at peace? You got this jackass in my life? You know what he does. Am I talking to the wrong people here or, or, or the right people? Okay. All right. See, so, so we have these other people. The prophet said, I'm a man of unclean tongue, but that ain't my problem. Every time I confess it and I get hurt and, and I start speaking like Jesus, you send me back to my people, and they're just full of it. They provoke me. They, they, you, just, you kill them, and I'm going to be wonderful. <laughs> Wave your hand if you got somebody in your life that just, uh, just, just takes the, the, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he says, it's a process of transformation. Anybody ever an ugly caterpillar? Nasty, chewing up, you, full, you step on them, the green guck in them, the leaves and so on. But it takes a long time, and then they go in a cocoon, you don't see them and so on. And then they, they transform and metamorphize into this beautiful blood uh, that gets killed on an 18-wheeler's front as it's going down the eight. You know. Hey, look how beautiful. What? Okay, so most of us are still in the ugly, ugly caterpillar stage. We had this little period of time where we finally died to ourselves. And by that time, our heart stops. And thank God we go to be with Jesus. But those he foreknew, he also predestined them to be conformed to the image of his dear son. Now, here's the difference with his dear son. They're nailing him to the cross. They're whipping him. Father, forgive him. We don't like somebody to pull in front of us. We don't like yesterday, come, coming from, from my place in, in Myrtle Grove, three different traffic lights. That woman in front of me, they would finally turn green. She, she, you got to lean on the horn because she's, she's YouTubing and texting and Facebooking on her phone. And I'm waiting behind her. I'm trying to be nice. I'm, and I'm speaking in tongues. I'm buying the devil. She doesn't move. Then I lay hands and then she's, you was around you. (laughs) 
So get out the way, you old bag. I have to go preach the love of Jesus to the masses. <laughs> Paul describes the supernatural change in a much better way. Glory to glory. Say out loud. Look, put your Holy Ghost hand up there. Say, I'm being changed. Glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all, every one of us with unveiled faces are looking as in the mirror at the glory of the Lord and being transformed into the same image of Jesus Christ from glory to glory. The problem he's not telling us is as a massive change happens to get from this glory to that glory. And we just not in that big a hurry to go to the next glory. Because there's all kinds of change. And there's all kinds of circumstances and situations and just not fair. It's wrong. I can't believe you allowed this. Why is this person breathing? How did they get up this morning? Why are they in front of me? And, and he said, do you want to go to the next glory? Yeah. Well, suck it up in the name of Jesus. Die a little debtor. Get back up on the cross, Michael Patrick Millet. We are, in reality, forced into this world change. We didn't vote for this. That's one of the reasons we upset about it. We had no voice in it. You ever go down the street and they're tearing up the street and they're putting it in there? They never asked me. They never even told me they want to do this. I have no voice in this. I am powerless. Now I am a victim of somebody else. See, we have to, we have no alternative to recognize God is in control of this. God has decided he's not going to just do this in Harvey. This is, all, this is all over. People are whining and screaming all over. People feel this is unfair. The problem is I don't know where this is going to end. And just when I think we're, we're going to go back to normal, now the second time it's going to be worse. And now the bird flu is coming. <laughs> My God, I hate birds. I ain't even going to eat chicken no more. The bird flu. But you see, he's going to touch the natural, physical, relational, geographical, financial, and of course, he's really affecting a spiritual change. But most of us are so hung up on the financial that we can't stand it. You are dealing with my hopes and dreams in retirement right now. I prayed and cried and so on that I would have my own business and you so blessed me with my own business. And now you let them take it away. How dare you? How unfair. Now, you may not say that. So you redirect it, just like when we don't curse. Darn it. <laughs> Heck. We got all them alternative ways to, to, you know, it ain't cursing. God darn it. So instead of telling him how upset we are, we murmur to one another, hoping that he was listening. <laughs> after all I've done for him, after all I've given up for him, and this is what I get. See, we see spiritual change. Change as a child to a man, we understand this, 
when I was a child, I used to speak like a child. I used to reason and think and imagine like a child. I used to act like a child because I was a child. But then when I get processed over time, get my hand slapped enough, get punished enough, find out this doesn't work, lose my privileges, start to, you know, start to think, you know, this is not smart for me. So we find ourselves in a situation where all of a sudden now we grow up if we ever do, and understand that the process of growing up in childhood when you wet your britches, that wasn't unacceptable. You were a child. Children don't have internal control. When you break something precious, that's not unnecessary and unacceptable when you're a child. It's when you bring that into your now. Pitching a fit when you're three years old, that's un not unnecessary, nor is it unacceptable because children pitch fits. It's when you're 42 years old and you're in the kitchen and you're breaking plates, screaming and hollering, that's not acceptable. You have to put everything in the season that it was, and we progress into a next, another section. We're not children anymore. We're not on the baby bottle anymore. Now we're on the meat of the word. Because it's not about my bill of rights and my promises that I tell him, hey, you owe me, and I'm entitled as a Christian because I know what my bill of rights are. That was in a time you know, preached in churches. Now we're in a point, we go back to Jesus said, this is how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, you get your will done in this earth. And I have no say in this. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. See, understand that the process of growing up in childhood is not unnecessary, unacceptable. It's just limited to that particular season, but God doesn't want to leave you that way. Just like he says, ever learning and never coming to the level of the truth. Now, the problem is Jesus learned obedience by the things he suffered. We, we, we don't pray for more suffering. You know, I want to obey you so much, but you know what? I don't quite get it. I need a little bit more suffering, Jesus. No, we pray every prayer in avoidance of anything that we think is un in uncomfortable, uh, uh, unfamiliar, our whole prayer life is to guard us from the ability to be able to obey him. Everything that ever happened to you did not happen without God's permission. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Because every one of us is uniquely, uniquely, have a potential for God's purposes. And he allows you to go that, so in like kind, you think you want to obey, you think you will obey, you might think you're obedient, but you don't know your own heart. And we don't pray for brokenness. Everybody knows a, a, with, a, with a, a child, rebellion must be broken. You don't break his spirit. You might have to break his behind, but you don't break his spirit. Okay. There's encouragement that goes along with correction, and God does that for us all the time. The problem is most of us avoid everything we possibly can not to be uncomfortable and inconvenienced. Therefore, we never develop the ability to be able to obey what we don't understand or to feel free and rejoice when God intervenes and he says, I'm, okay, get out the way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prophetically bring my promise into manifestations. That's what happened with the Jews. They refused to let Messiah be Messiah. Coming in for a landing here, 
in refusing God's changes, and I'm going to submit to you again, be careful murmuring about what's going on. It, it might be uncomfortable, but I want you to know again, God is in control. And we're going to have to put our faith in God is in control, and he's not watching television right now. So the alternative to accepting divine necessary change is God drastically revealing himself to you cataclysmically. For example, you won't humble yourself, he'll allow you to be humiliated. You had a chance to humble yourself. But no, you wouldn't humble yourself before the Lord. Now you're humiliated. How about this? How about with our children? Bobby, put away the toys we're about to eat. Bobby, put away the toys we're about to eat. Robert Michael Terrio, I'm going to bust your butt for if you don't do that. And then ultimately, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> You know he's mean and ugly, and he, was, he had a hard day. He's gonna, he wants to tear somebody's butt up. You see, if you don't, now watch. You, you take, take the grape, you want grape juice, and you squeeze it. Well, what if it's a tough grape? You got more pressure. Finally, you get a hammer to hit that thing. Okay. Now, Tyler over there, Tyler's been a rough guy. He, he's, he's tough. He don't, you don't play with Jesus, the scripture, nothing. You don't play. You know, you, 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 now, watch. And he goes, I think I'm too hard. I said, no, 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 no. There's tack hammers. There's little lady hammers. There's carpenter hammers. There's ball peen hammers. And there's jack hammers. God's got, got tools. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You might be married to a jackhammer, you hard-headed, hard-headed thing. He gently leads. Now, he will never not speak to you above a still, small voice. So he's not going to shout at you. He's just going to turn up on the heat. But he doesn't like punitive. He does it in love to bring us to where we're supposed to be. Without submission to divine change, seldom or if ever does anyone ever become spiritually mature. The Lord arranges a series of seasons in it. Why, I, I said, I, I was trying to think, I said, Lord, why do you, man, this is a season, and it season comes and season go, and, and either it's a long interview or it's, he lets you catch your breath. Why? Because he knows we're not able to really do it right the first time. Seven times in the same day, get you back up. God uses this inculcation, this iterative situation and gradualism in it to get us, to help us a little at time because he knows that we can't get. Matter of fact, he says he pities us. But the word pity is the same word as Jesus saw the masses. He had compassion for them because they couldn't help themselves. Amen. And he still does. Jesus says, little children growing up that just didn't get it yet. Now, nobody think he's mad at you. He's not mad at you. He's for you, and he's, but he's going he's, he's gonna to get you to where you're supposed to go. The steps of the righteous are ordered by God, not ordered by you. I preached this 48 years ago repeatedly for, uh, for several years. Jeremiah 48, 11, it helped me greatly. Moab, now remember when you read it, he's talking about a tribe of people, a section, a, a city of people. But he's really talking about you and me. He says, Moab has been at ease since his youth. He has also been undisturbed on his lees. That's what settles at the bottom of a, uh, of a bottle. Neither has he emptied, been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into exile. He has been allowed to settle. Therefore, he retains his flavor, and he still smells the same. It hasn't changed since the time he was put in that bottle. 
what they're talking about is they would crush the grapes and then they would take that juice and they had a funnel and they would pour it in the bottles and they take the bottles, put a cork on it, actually wax, stick it on a shelf and for so many days they didn't touch it. They didn't move it at all and the, the pieces of, of fruit, the, the stems, toenails, you know, leaves, the skin of the grape would settle and that's called the dregs or the leaves. And so after so many days, they would take it and put another bottle, put a funnel, and they would pour very carefully not to disturb the dregs, the leaves. And so now they would take that wine, put it back on a shelf, and so it, it only now had almost microscopic things, and they would leave it there for so many days, and then it would, it, it would settle on the bottom, and then they would pour it again, and it was a process of purification. Follow that. Well, God says... To those that, like Moab, you don't want me to move you. You don't want to move with the process. You've decided you're settling, you're camping out, you're going as far as you're going to go. He says, the next verse says, Moab has settled on his leaves. So I'm going to call, you ready for this? For the tippers of the vessel and the breakers of the bottle. Right now in our world, he has called for the tipples of the vessel, all the pride, all the stuff, it, 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 it's flowing out in front of everybody. And he's breaking systems down. Everything is shutting down. This will never be again and so on. Now, forget the world. We're talking about you and me. The tradition of men makes the voice of God impotent. So God has to circumstantially bring things in our life so that we'll move, we allow him to move us and change us in the process of gradualism, iterative, repetition, because we're not getting it. Now again, it's not punitive, he's not angry, he'll never leave us nor forsake us, but it causes us to literally be moved by the Spirit of God even when we don't want to go. Now, coming, to, coming in, becoming at ease, undisturbed and refusing or ignoring change caused Moab to avoid the process of purification and mature. I know of no other scriptural process, this is Mike talking, of the Lord uses to manifest himself in our lives. Now, Philippians 3, and whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of surpassing the value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, personally, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all as just trash and rubbish so that I might gain Christ and may be found in him not having any righteousness of my own derived from keeping the law, but that which is through faith in Christ alone, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to the cross. We, we're not, your, your children aren't going to be thrown to the lions Tuesday. They're not going to stone you at Walmart. You're not going to be imprisoned. Man, we're on a cakewalk right now. We just, we just got our normal being tilted, moved, shaken. Paul ends this dramatic account of change by recognizing his losses he sustained to know Christ and that all lives to have Christ Nothing in this life can compare to knowing Jesus. Seasons of drastic change are a scriptural fact. The spiritual transition to maturity may be traumatic to the soul, but it's divinely necessary. And I close with this, Job 13, 15. Even if he slay me, I will trust him. I know personally in whom I have believed and I don't know if he's going to do it today or tomorrow, but I know he is able to deliver me. And I trust him. Give a shout unto the Lord. 
Elaine introduced me to this, this scripture because the scripture, as you well know, is that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Expectations not met make you angry. Okay. Psalm 62, 5. Let all that I am in my soul wait patiently before God. And you know what? I give up all my expectations on how life and people need to be, how they are. I put all my expectations in God that he's perfect entire lacking nothing and that he has my life in his hands and whatever he wants to do with it I already sold it at Calvary would you stand for me I want you to read one more to you Isaiah 37 20 says now O Lord rescue and deliver us from our enemies that all the kingdoms of this world will know that you alone are the Lord now, look, I'd love to say this is the abortionists, the perverted homosexuals, uh, the, the, the ungodly liberals. But right now, I got closer enemies than that. I got self-consciousness. I got memories. I, I, I have vain imaginations. I have fears. I got my temperament and my personality. I got enough enemies right here that try to keep me out of the kingdom every day. Raise your hands, and I want you to read that out loud. Now, O oh Lord, rescue and deliver me from my enemies, that all the kingdoms of the world will know that you alone, O oh Lord, and I have no king but Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! All right.